do a quick overview of the council member's bio, and then we'll go from there. Sounds good. All right, so now we're live. Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Conversation with Council Member Eric Dinowitz, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education for the New York City Council and also Co-Chair of the Bronx Delegation. Uh, the program will begin in approximately three minutes. Thank you. For some reason, I can't find the background to my screen on my laptop. So I have to blur everything out. You mean I can't talk? Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Conversation with Council Member Eric Dinowitz, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education for the New York City Council. We'll begin the program in approximately two minutes. Okay, good morning and welcome to Coffee and Conversation uh, hosted by the Bronx Chamber of Commerce. Today is Thursday, November 17th, and we are very pleased to welcome Council Member Eric Dinowitz. Council Member Dinowitz chairs the New York City Council Committee on Higher Education. He is also the co-chair for the Bronx Delegation and the former chair of the Committee on Veterans. I'd love to introduce our uh, president of the Bronx Chamber of Commerce, Lisa Soren, for opening remarks. Lisa. Thank you, Mike, and good morning, Councilman. I wanna thank you for being here this morning. Um, this Coffee and Conversation series has been something that uh, our members and general public have been really excited about. It's an opportunity to have a chit chat per se um, about you know, your successes, challenges, what do we look for in the future? Um, and I wanna thank you for taking the time out this morning to share some of your thoughts. Um, and thank you, Mike, for taking the leadership on this program that's been so very successful. And happy Thursday, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. And thank you, Council Member, for joining us today. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, details just to set the table a bit. There will be a facilitated Q&A box uh, in the Zoom. <clears throat> we also uh, welcome our folks who are watching us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and this will also be aired on the Bronx Chamber's YouTube YouTube channel. Um, so with the housekeeping issues uh, aside, uh, Council Member Dinowitz ha is not new to the Bronx, uh, certainly for, for, for many reasons, starting off his career as an educator, but then elected into the city council where he currently chairs the Committee on Higher Education and is also the chair of the New York City Council uh, Jewish Caucus, and of course, the co-chair of the Bronx Delegation. Uh, Council Member Dinowitz uh, served previously as the chair for the Committee on Veteran Affairs, uh, and he has taken the Bronx by storm, uh, introducing a uh, fun spirit to the delegation, uh, one of camaraderie, but also one of, to use an overused phrase, get things done. 
or get stuff done uh, in New York City. So Council Member Dinowitz, we are so grateful to have you here today. Uh, and just to you know, lay things out, if you want to just go into a little bit about yourself and about some of the, the objectives or priorities that you're working on, and then we can go into just a informal Q&A and we'll, we'll field some things from, from the folks about you know, what excites you, and then we'll go from there. Great, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Yeah, you're the first, Michael, you're the first person to uh, introduce me as someone who's bringing fun to the Bronx. <laughs> and I'm saying, you know what, that's, uh, I think that's true. So we, I am very proud in the Bronx. I'm, I'm a co-chair actually of the Bronx delegation. Althea Stevens is my co-chair. Uh, and one of the things we recognize is that this job in all its forms is about people. And we've worked very hard um, you know, to, to to make sure that things are getting done, that we are a unit. And as it happens, we all like each other very much. And and I do believe we have the, the strongest, most unified delegation. Uh, and part of that is that we do, we like each other. We have difficult conversations with, with one another. Um, but we, you know, we always try to do trips. So we've visited, for example, you know, Hunts Point together, because that's a huge, 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 hugely important part of the Bronx for commercial reasons for environmental reasons. So we visited there a few times and we've done other trips. So we've also, you know, we hang out. Um, but we've also done important things uh, as a unified borough. So as many of you know, we we just went through a redistricting process as Lisa knows very well. We went through a redistricting process in the Bronx. And one of the things we worked very hard to do was talk to each other and work with each other um, to talk about what are the neighborhoods, what are the needs of the neighborhoods, um, and how is that reflected in the lines? But also importantly, to do something which um, I think the Bronx has been struggling with, and that is to engage the residents of the Bronx. So we, you know, we did community outreach. We did, and, and Lisa actually came to one of these. We had online a district-wide education forum for um, for redistricting, and it was, you know, it was on BronxNet. It was streamed on on YouTube and Facebook, and. We, it was translated into, I think, eight different languages, which is which is so important to, to in order to engage people in the Bronx. And that's also been something that's important to me. Uh, Michael mentioned I was a, I was a public school teacher. I taught special education in our high schools, um, and language access was was hugely important. Most of my students in the Bronx, um, if they spoke another language, it was Spanish. And one of the things I recognized early on was that. If I wanted to have conversations with the families of my students, uh, I was going to need to learn a little Spanish. So I, I went off to Guatemala for a couple of weeks, took some tutoring, and I came back uh, and I knew enough Spanish to say, you know, important things like if, if your child's doing their homework or not, if they're late to class or they're on time, you know, those those sorts of things. You're going to have uh, to give us an example. You know that, right? <laughs> no, I no, I do not. <laughs> um, I, it's, it's easier when it's, um, not on the, on the zoom. If you, if you want to translate this into Spanish later, we'll, we'll, we'll go for it. Uh, but, um, uh, but, but that was, you know, the stories of my families, of my students and their, and their families, you know, what I always said during the campaign is though, that's what I would bring to, to city hall with me. Uh, and that's exactly what I've done. So uh, among other things, um, one of the most recent bills that I'm working on involves students with disabilities. Um, I, I, you know, Michael asked some of the things I'm working on. I'm just gonna talk about this one very quickly because it's the most recent and I think I'm most excited about it. Um, students K-12 or now pre-K or K through 12 have, if they have a disability, they have an IEP, um, which describes their disability and describes, you know, their goals and everything. Uh, and then they graduate and they get to college what you know or whatever training program that is and they have to kind of start that process over and very often they are not told how to start that process no one does outreach to them to get them to start that process because the IEP is wholly contained that disability document wholly contained within their uh, department of education school so the bill I introduced and we just heard it at my last committee hearing pretty much says uh, that the mayor's office of people with disabilities has to create a program that can easily transfer some piece of information from high school to college at, if the student requests it. You know, we're not trying to break um, any, any federal rules, but if the student and the family wants it, they can transfer that information. So the college knows that that student has a disability 
and they can transfer their IEP so that can serve as documentation for accommodations. Uh, and this is so critically important because colleges are not recognizing um, or identifying in the first place the students who have IEPs. And we know students are students with disabilities. And we know students with disabilities are more likely uh, to drop out. And by the way, this would include, you know, ideally things in the workforce development field. Maybe they're not, the student's not getting a bachelor's degree, but they're going to CUNY. Uh, they're going to CUNY on the concourse, for example, to get job, you know, work training. Uh, we want to make sure that our students are getting every opportunity to succeed as possible. And sometimes that means accommodations. Um, so, so this is about providing for our students the tools they need to succeed, but also to make sure, you know, at a basic level that our government is functioning properly, that our government agencies are talking to one another, and that we are, you know, getting stuff done, as Michael said, um, by making sure our government's working together. And I have bills uh, I've introduced and I'm going to introduce which deal with our 311 system, which, which do this, <laughs> look at your eyes. If you can't, I, I don't know what your screens are for the, for the attendees, um, if I'm pinned, but you should have seen Lisa's eyes widen. Um, and it's about our government working better so that our constituents, uh, especially in the Bronx, because we know the Bronx is often left behind, so that especially our, our constituents in the Bronx, um, you know, have a voice and that we in the city council can conduct proper oversight. 311's work, 311 is working properly um, and residents know how to use it. And that's the other piece that, that we in the Bronx delegation are planning alongside my legislation to make 311 work better is to do outreach um, and make sure that people know how to use 311. Because, Mar because every single time we have these hearings, these oversight hearings, um, we ask for data and a city agency will provide 311 data. And if you just go by the 311 data, it looks like the Bronx doesn't have as many problems as it actually does. And that is in part because of people not calling 311. And part of that is going back to language access, um, what we do with the redistricting education. And so there is, of course, legislation uh, that I've co-sponsored that other people have introduced. I've co-sponsored dealing with language access on 311, um, but, it's, but it's comprehensive in nature and making sure that as our young students grow up, they have those tools to succeed, and that our residents who are here now um, have those tools to make their voices heard uh, in city government so we can best uh, address your needs. I wanna leave it there because I feel like there might be uh, some questions. <laughs> I have so much to say. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> and be careful, she's only had a half cup of coffee, so this could really go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> well, she's one. gonna be talking much more slowly because she only had half exactly. cup of coffee. You know me well, Councilman. First of all, I have to say on the redistricting, it was probably one of the most challenging experience I have had, but proudly, and I've had this come from many people, that the Bronx had it the easiest. Why? Because of the leadership of yourself and uh, Councilwoman Stevens, you really went out of your way. And granted, there's a lot more to do because I think that um, people don't understand or haven't been instructed enough or educated enough to understand that the redistricting is part of the census and the census, like all of that intertwines. And so, and for me, that all begins in the school system. I think that it's super important that this fear that happened during 2020's census taking really impacted um, the ability for people to be honest on their census or actually even fill it out. Because um, unfortunately, I feel we lost a lot of resources for that. <clears throat> um, so but a huge shout out to the Bronx and the Bronx delegation. Um, we were we were patted on the back for the amount of work and the fact that you all came forward and testified, which made the Bronx look really good and made my job that much easier. So uh, my fight began with other boroughs and not the Bronx. <laughs> so for that, I'm going to thank you. Second, um, the IEP um, jumping out of my seat and, and applauding it. And I'll tell you why, because my daughter, my eldest daughter, um, had an IEP. I did not know what that was when she started school. 
Um, hers came from a hearing loss. And so when we say disabilities, the disabilities can be from very minor things as um, as I did my research of learning how to switch classes when you get to middle school to, um, and they call that resource room, to providing services in school and outside of school. And the challenges of when you decide um, in a high school setting to put a child in a Catholic school versus a public school system. Um, when she transferred to college, it was a lot of homework to figure out how to get her the hearing services in a college setting to make her successful. Because as much as people may complain about the public school system in general, and I'll speak solely for the Bronx, with parents' involvement and the understanding of what an IEP is, the public school system offers everything our children need. But parents don't realize the amount of resources that some of our children have. And I find myself pretty educated and very proactive as a mom, but it took me a lot of battles and a lot of research to be able to understand the system of IEP. Um, you know, it's also a parent's um, concern to have a child labeled as special needs because a disability and IEP doesn't necessarily mean special needs or um, special education. Not that there's anything wrong with that, right? So there's a whole um, group of things within that. So I applaud you as a mom of a previous who graduated college and bachelor's and works for the federal government now. And I applaud the system um, and the ability that I had to research. But when you have our legislators taking the lead on that, um, that says that you're listening. So as a mom of a former IEP student, I thank you. And I hope that those listening in understand that the public school system, as, um, as a perception may lead to believe it's not great and there's a lot to be done. Um, the resources are there. You just have to know how to access them. And I, I want to highlight, you know, kind of highlight one of the things you said and just put it a little differently is that I think, well, I know a lot of people when they hear disability, they either think someone in a wheelchair or they think um, someone with an intellectual disability. Correct. Um, the, the truth is <clears throat> many people with disabilities turn out to be, I don't know, our public advocate or our exactly. mayor. And in my view, the more that they talk about their disability, the more it does for the disability uh, community. Because a disability could be dyslexia. Um, a disability could be, you know, a whole, it could be hearing loss. It could be a whole host of things. And it just means someone needs, a, you know, some sort of accommodation or a little support. But functionally, what it means for us, if we're not addressing those needs, I think for the business community, is we are leaving 20, if we just throw aside 20%, the 20% the of students who have IEPs in high school, we are missing out on 20% of potential employees, which is hugely problematic for businesses, but also for, for people. Because, you know, think about what happens to those students who aren't given the opportunity. If they're not given the support in high school, uh, and they're not given the transition services to college. And this is, a, by the way, just to be clear, this is a systemic um, oh, yeah. issue, uh, problem, but a systemic solution, not, hey, teachers here do more work. Hey, parents here do more work. It is, it is no. supposed to make our system work better. But they don't get the supports early on. Um, and they don't get those transitions. Um, you know, we see that um, there's a gr much greater prevalence of students with disabilities in our jail system. And you know who who turn out uh, to be homeless, uh, unhoused, right? So fr from their end, you know we are we we are not addressing the problem head on, and when we need to, and so those students grow up to have more severe issues, and then as as businesses we are losing out on a significant portion of the population who are potential employees, and as I mentioned, those em those employees could end up being the mayor and the public advocate. And, and I say that because I think it's, it's, it's so powerful to, uh, to see that, to see people with disabilities talk so openly about it um, and be in positions of power. Uh, in fact, at the hearing, you know, we had students who said, um, 
who testified and said, you know, I really struggled um, to find the office for students with disabilities. I still don't know where it is, but I've managed to make my way through uh, college. Um, they testified. But the more powerful thing is when two of my colleagues testified and they said they have the disability. And if not for their friends who happened to know where this office was and who happened to know the process and took them to the office, they would not have gotten those accommodations and they would not have gotten those supports. So, you know, for the students, for our society, for our, for our city uh, and for our businesses, I think it's vitally important that we are paying attention to students with disabilities who clearly have a lot uh, to offer as, as if I need to state the obvious. Mm -hmm. um, so much to offer. I totally agree and support it. Mike, one last thing before we jump on, and you're 100% correct as it relates to the workforce. Um, they are incredible and all inclusive. The 311, and you saw my eyebrows go up. Um, yesterday, the commission met that the mayor had put together for small businesses and challenges. Um, and the main topic under one of the, the categories that I'm co-chairing is the 311 system. Mm -hmm. And so for businesses, and, and we'll mix this in a little bit, what we have found as business um, leaders, business owners, small businesses, is that 311 is also used as a tool of revenge um, against businesses. For instance, there are moratoriums being um, lifted for awnings, right? The signage on your store to make, make it easy. That, that lift was, um, during the de Blasio administration, was taken off. The businesses did not know about it. <clears throat> and so businesses were getting fined. Why does this have to do with 311? The call started flooding the system, mostly from Brooklyn, from 311 about illegal signage, dangerous signage, so on and so forth. It turns out that it was an awning company that was calling in those 311s. The businesses were getting violations for five, ten thousand dollars for their signage, unbeknown to them that the moratorium on the changes for awnings had taken place. And so I know there isn't a one resolution to 311, but as it relates to business um, in this forum, it is really, really problematic as to how 311 can be used in a way that doesn't trigger an unnecessary inspection, unnecessary fines, because you have people either wanting to um, make business off these calls or in a personal case that I saw as a bid director, uh, landlord to landlord, um, angry landlords calling on each other and having these triggers. Um, so I don't know what the fix is, Councilman, but as you're looking at the 311 system, I think it's really important that something be looked at. And from the commission side, we're also looking at it, but 311 is a fabulous tool. But 311 is a challenging tool. It's long and you know, you have to maintain your numbers and you don't know what's coming from it. And you know, this, and by the time you're given a confirmation number, people hang up because they're just frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the let's get even an opportunity just to take down my neighbor. Um, so I put that out there because that's a feedback we're getting from a lot of businesses. And because you brought 311 up, I think it's important that we incorporate all of it, especially as it relates to businesses. And Michael, I will now keep quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I think I think that 311 is actually a really important issue. And you know, I'm grateful to the council member for taking it on. Um, I, and I know it's probably not the sexiest issue in the world, but it is so important to how our city functions. Um, you know, and I think largely, you know, from from the on the ground feedback that we get on 311. I, I think a lot of businesses and even residents just um they don't have faith in 311 that things are actually being being handled. And I, I can say this, uh, you know, at least in, I both have experiences in the bid world, um, that you know, we are are very methodical about 311. Like I do, I'm on with 311 every morning, uh, from light pole conditions to potholes to crosswalks that need to get painted. And, you know, it, it is a little bit disheartening when you've done 
33 one one calls in a week and those issues still aren't being fixed so uh, let me you, tell you about my bill I want to hear about the bill. Let's talk okay. about it. I love let me, it. Let me just go back to something Lisa said, which, and, and I, you know, I see some um, on the attendees, some uh, familiar names, but also many not. I, I, in my district, I have um, two bids in my council, two bids um, and some other uh, business organizations. Um, and I, at least in district 11, and I'm sure in other districts, some bids are more effective at communicating and partnering with their council member, and some bids are not. Um, and some community organizations are not, and they don't know how, or they don't, and like th that spectrum exists. I say that to say my incoming from uh, about 301 comes mostly from non-business owning constituents. Um, and so if, if you're on and you're, you're dealing with businesses, I would encourage them to contact a local council member because what we do let's say it's about a constituent calls about a light pole um they call 311 and then we call the agency and say here's the 311 complaint and we try to push it along as best that we can um i i would i would really love it if businesses did more of that um because it would it would it would not only help us help the businesses but also help us fix systemic problems that may exist in the three in one system, like Lisa was mentioning. Michael, you mentioned that you call three in one and you don't know what happens with it, or you know it doesn't get fixed. Or what what we've seen on the three one one app, people put in three one three one one complaints, and then the app says, "Oh, the case is closed." But then you look at that light pole, or you look at the illegally parked car, or you look at the pothole, and it is not close. And so I have a few bills that I've introduced or that I'm going to introduce about 301, but one of them is about a feedback system. You know, like if you take an Uber, how was your ride? You know, it's one of the basic things you learn as a teacher in education, which is assessment, um, in feedback, instant feedback. The more immediate the feedback, the better. And so when a case is closed with my bill, a user would be able to say whether to in their view it was closed or not and certainly throw one's massive and it works for some things better than others um but you know if a car is still parked at a hydrant and the police say that it was closed but it's still there you could say no this case is not closed to my satisfaction the car is still there no the case is not closed to my satisfaction because the light pole is still damaged or still out the pothole is not fixed, and yet 311 or the agency said it's closed. And what that does for us and for the city, it, it allows us greater oversight and allows us to have accountability. Right? You know, the, it allows the agencies to actually be held accountable. Because right now, the only accountability is on Twitter. Uh, and Twitter's not real life. Um, and also Elon Musk. Come on. So there's that. But then the other, the other bill I have that I introduced was. Um, allowing photo and video evidence to be submitted for 301 complaints for agencies to use. Um, there's, there's two more 301 bills that I haven't introduced yet, um, but also seek to make the system work, uh, work better. And so those will be introduced in the coming, I hope, weeks. Uh, we have one stated in the 22nd and then another one in December. So I'm hoping to introduce those and again, the goal is, you know, you said it's not sexy. I think it's very sexy to make government work better because when government work be works better, people actually have a better quality of life. The interesting thing about quality of life, and I, I never forget this, is I, during the start of the pandemic, we were all locked in our homes. I started doing senior outreach. This was before I was in the council. I was just, you know, reaching out to older adults. I would reach out and I'd say, hey, how's everything going? A lot of people would say, you know, I, I'm doing okay, but I'm running out of food. Um, so I set up meal deliveries for them. But during a pandemic, when friends around them were literally dying and they were shut in their homes, people were complaining about noise. People were complaining about the light being out. People were, compl people were complaining about their quality of life when there was literally death surrounding them. That is how important quality of life is to us in New York. And so 
while, while making systems work better doesn't sound great. It doesn't sound cool. The result is very cool. The result is people having a better quality of life, a better experience and a better life here in the city and in the Bronx. Absolutely. And I, I think that's important, uh, particularly for the folks who are, who are tuning in to realize that, you know, efficiency can be sexy. Getting things done, uh, to not overuse the term, which is being overused all the time now, but getting things done is, is really important. And I, you know, I, I really like the idea of a feedback loop. Um, you know, we, we work Third Avenue, we, we're not your atypical, but we work a lot in public health. Um, and having that feed, feedback loop is really, really important. And, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, there's a 311 complaint about not having crosswalks. DOT, they come and they paint the crosswalks, they take a picture of the crosswalks painted, you can see it's closed, right? It's like, this is what we said we're gonna do. Here's what we did, it's done, it's over. You know, and that seems like a very simple way of doing it. You know, if Amazon can take a picture of your package at your front door to say it's been delivered, it seems like city government could do something like that to say that the work that they said is done is done. Yeah, yep. <laughs> it, and, that, and that's kind of the thing, right? If it's good enough for Amazon, if it's good enough for Uber, then it's good enough for the biggest, greatest city in the world. Absolutely, a hundred percent. And just think, uh, you got a ton of love, hearts and things like that on social media, on the students with disabilities uh, plan that you, you've been rolling out. Uh, so so there, there are folks who are saying, um, beautiful and amazing. Just, just so you, just uh, it's important oh, that you also on Facebook. Also, is that where we are? I, where I, where I don't. We've got our communications person that's handling all that, but I'm, I'm gonna say yes, we are. Okay. Cool. <laughs> um, uh, but so you know, we, we spoke a lot about you know how do we uh, build up a workforce, uh, and you know, in, in New York City, we have we have a shortage in terms of work, work, workforce for certain sectors. Now, in terms of bridging the, the gap between higher education and the workforce, what are some, some methods or some ideas that you might have to help New York retain our students who are, are you know, going to our universities and, and things of that sort? How do we make sure that we are, we're attracting those folks to stay in the city of New York, to stay in the Bronx, to really become, you know, to, to continue being part of our, our economic engine instead of going to Florida or Wyoming or a terrible place like Texas or, you know, something like that. Oh, how many hours do you have? <laughs> I, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few things and I'll actually start in high school for two reasons. One of because of a resolution that I'm introducing um, the next date and because that's where I started my career was a high school teacher for 14 years. Um, so one is, whether it's high school or college, what are students getting from these institutions of learning? And what is the purpose of that institution of learning? So the resolution, for example, and this doesn't relate directly to a specific job, but it's the same idea. It's a resolution saying, look, we got to do civic education in New York City public schools, but we also have to connect it to a certification, right? We go, students go to high school and they take chemistry most students aren't going into chemistry why do they take chemistry because they need to take it for their high school diploma for that piece of paper and we should have a similar mentality but a more purposeful and functional mentality um and so if it's civic education students can receive some sort of um certification certificate or a micro credential to put on their LinkedIn profile saying, I've been trained in New York City civic education. I know all about participatory budgeting. I know about community boards. I know how the city council works. I know how voting works. And that is something that they could say to an employer or a college and really sell themselves. I visited uh, CUNY on the concourse. And I think some of the programs they have there are incredible. They have a nursing program that I saw that takes students in high school, they do some summer training. And then they have a Lehman College has a nursing program. And the students know that if they complete this nursing program, there is a job for them. Because the, 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 the healthcare field, the nursing field is growing. And so they get trained in this and students um, you know, have that education that they need. And it's pretty good paying job, if, if you ask me being a nurse. Um, and that's really important for our um, especially for our students in the Bronx who, um, you know, economically are, aren't doing as well as, as a lot of other places in the city. Um, 
So seeing that through line of high school and college and making it purposeful. And what do we do in the city? We got in the city budget, I think, um, $2 million um, to outfit the nursing school at Lehman College, um, because that is purposeful money that is meeting the need. Um, they had other programs there. Uh, one was like a small business incubator where they were students learning how to be, um, I guess they were small business consultants and the small businesses in the Bronx could go there. And they, for I think it was for free because these students were students. They were learning how to be consultants, helping them set up websites, helping them set up online uh, finance and online, uh, you know, how do you sell things online? Um, and the businesses were getting a benefit of it. And the, ben the other benefit of it was these were students who are from the Bronx, who have you know similar cultural background or similar language and are able to connect. So those are just two examples of how CUNY and our school system can meet the need of us here in the Bronx. Now, here's the problem. And I've brought this up. We had the hearing on students with disabilities. We've had the hearing on workforce development was before that and the hearing on online learning before that. And one of the big problems that we have with CUNY is they don't advertise. And I understand advertising dollars could be a lot, but they could also be not that much. And what I did was I literally went on Google during the hearing, you know, you go on Google, it's like, and I went online learning, you know, co online colleges. And CUNY didn't show up. You would think, you know, even if they know my algorithm, which is, I Google CUNY a lot, because that's my committee, you would think CUNY School of Blank, CUNY uh, Professional Studies, school, online learning would pop up, but it, but it doesn't. And so CUNY has, you know, a ways to go in making sure that if a business or a prospective business owner, a prospective employee, someone who wants workforce development, Googles any of those things that would pop up an advertisement for for those for those programs. So, you know, it's not it's not a whole hearing topic, but it is one of those things that, have, that has come up every single time. Because the truth is, CUNY does have an incredible amount to offer our city. Um, it has you know the CUNY and the Congress, as I mentioned, not and of course bachelor's degrees, which is, you know, what you expect of every college. And the last, you know, the last thing I would say more in like the bachelor's master's degree program is a program I did. I did a program straight out of college called the New York City Teaching Fellows. And the purpose of this program was to take what they, they said it was really geared towards second career people, but they took some college kids. I was, I was 21. So I was a kid. Um, and say, all right, look, we're going to subsidize your master's, but you're going to teach in a high needs neighborhood in a high needs subject area. Um, and that was the deal. It's like, you're going to give the city something specific that we need, and you are going to get a very low cost master's degree. You are going to get a, 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 you know, a job, a union job right away. And you're going to give the city what, what we need. And the thing about the fellows program is most of the teachers that I worked with stayed in the fellows program past like the, uh, I think the, the three or five years that most teachers burn out, they stay, I was one of them. So we, so we have models for programs that work in the city. And what I'm trying to do is sort of leverage the programs that exist and help, um, you know, make them work for more people. I hope, and help make sure that people in New York City know about the incredible programming that CUNY does do, because we need CUNY, um, and we're seeing an attrition in, in terms of um, in terms of students. We're seeing fewer and fewer students at our CUNY institutions. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do, um, but I think it's also important to recognize that there is good work being done. No, that's amazing. And I think, um, Lisa, we should send the uh, Small Business Resource Network team over to CUNY and we can work on some search engine optimization over, over there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think do. our team has, which is fabulous. I, I'd like to bring up a suggestion that I brought up a few years ago, quite a few years ago, with the former president of Osos Community College. Um, because we all know the borough, we're, the Bronx is a borough of colleges and universities. I think we're sitting at about 13. Um, one thing that I've always been interested in, because CUNY is phenomenal, um, I attended a CUNY, then went private, um, is to bring the presidents together. We had discussed that a while back, 
um, and figure out, and this, this goes deep into um, the mindset, because although there's this competitiveness between um, colleges, private, public, whatever, um, as it relates to workforce development, the amount of opportunities for businesses and students and workforce development is outstanding. I've had the privilege of visiting a few colleges, Manhattan. I went and took the tour of St. Vincent's, um, which the campus blew my mind. I didn't know it was in the Bronx, but the conversations we had about, um, as, you, as you call them, which I love, unhoused students that they have on these campuses and the ability to have these high, quality education and their nursing program. Um, so it's just, there's so much information to share. And I find that our borough lacks that ability to come together and share those resources and knowledge and figure out how it works best for our borough, our residents, our students, and our businesses. Um, and if that's something that you as the chair of the City Council for Education. Um, I know that Councilwoman Stevens is huge on anything youth um, education and programming. I would love as a Bronx Chamber to be able to be a part of that conversation because I've had individual conversations with many of these schools. I brought the challenges that we have had with students coming out of these schools, both private and public. And you know, while technology is phenomenal, uh, business, businesses, business offices still need a set of skills that seem to be lost in education moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to leave it mm -hmm. at that because I'm not looking to throw anything or anyone under the bus. But I think there needs to be a strong conversation as we work towards workforce development. And we, as you all been doing, leading by example, at the redistricting, I think, I think an opportunity to bring together our colleges and universities in our borough, and I'm very selfish, say just in our borough, um, would probably be fruitful across the board for residents and businesses and students alike. Just I, I don't think it's I don't think it's selfish to um, fight for the Bronx. <laughs> you know we. As it turns out, we always get left behind and it shouldn't be that way. <clears throat> and like, if I have anything to say about it, we won't be. And But that means doing exactly what I think we're doing in the Bronx delegation, which is which is bringing all of us together, you know, to identify and address the needs that we have here in the Bronx and doing it as a team. I mean, one example is Legionnaire's disease is a disease that um, it's something that impacts the Bronx more than any other any other borough. And two of our members, Councilman Farias and Pierina Sanchez, have legislation that is set, is set to address this because it is really a Bronx problem. But they didn't just introduce the legislation as a delegation. Uh, they introduced it as prime sponsor. We co-introduced it, all of us uh, together, because to show that this is a problem that we in the Bronx are going to address as a team. To end taking seriously. And you know, I'll just say one of the things about the unhoused students, it's it's not just if they're unhoused, it's if your uh, uh, your income is low, you're you're living under the poverty line, you have uh, your food insecure. My first hearing was about what's called the single stop successor programs, because there are supposed to be places on our college campuses where students can go one stop. Um, to address their housing needs, child care needs, health needs, food security needs, et cetera. And there's, there's two aspects to this, which I think are important. One is from the human right thing to do long-term you know, perspective, which is nobody should be unhoused. Nobody should be hungry. And it, it's the same problem. A lot of students didn't know about this, these programs at the school. There's a place you can go for this. Uh, but the other problem is boring and it sounds inhumane, but it is real and it is it is about finances. And we are facing in the city financial financial challenges. Agencies are being cut. We're not looking at the we don't have the best economic outlook right now, but these programs um, help bring in federal dollars and state dollars. If you sign someone for federal housing vouchers, for example, SNAP, WIC, those are federal programs. Um, and we are 
and, and they bring in federal dollars and, and they help us as a city um, address hunger and address housing in a way that makes uh, in, in a way that makes it so we have actually more funding to address housing and we have more funding to address food insecurity and mental health and all the other uh, aspects of a student's life that needs to be taken as a as a baseline for them to succeed uh, academically. Um, I know that there's a, a question about outdoor dining sheds. <laughs> and given yeah. given the term shed, um, I can tell that when you use the word shed, it means you don't like them, right? So- true. There, there are better <laughs> words to use, but you're right. <laughs> it's outdoor dining garden. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, so I, I'll just share my personal position and then kind of address what the council is doing. So I think, as you know, we had a long hearing on outdoor dining. I think during certain times of the year, outdoor dining can be good if they work with the community. My preference is if the street is big enough, I'm sorry, if the sidewalk is big enough to put a couple of tables and chairs out on the sidewalk. I think it's, I think it's a nice thing to be able to sit outside and if a restaurant um, needs the extra space, um, I think it's fine as long as you know it's not impeding upon pedestrian traffic, especially for someone with a disability, older adults, people in wheel wheelchairs, things like that. Um, I think it's okay if the if that's not an option, if the owner uh, wants to pay a fee to this to the city and say you're going to take a you know a parking spot and put out some tables and chairs in a way that is pretty and in a way that keeps um, the diners safe. Um, I also think it's important to work with the community boards and the, and the community, whatever that looks like. Um, so I think giving a little more time for the community board to kind of see an application and see what it looks like, just, just to make sure that it kind of, uh, you know, conforms to the neighborhood and that this isn't a business that is causing uh, problems. That this is a business that works with the with the community. Um, you know, in in community boards, um, well, in, the, in District Eleven, in Council District Eleven, um, we have some businesses who do it great, and some businesses where we've gotten complaints um, because it it takes up, you know, again, it, it takes up a lot of parking. And I know we're in an anti parking mode in the city, except. In the in certain parts of the Bronx, it's it's different than you know downtown Manhattan, where you have like forty five train lines and thirty seven bus lines. We don't have the same robust public transit. People have cars in the Bronx, and in order for me or you know my family, if we want to go out to dinner, we're probably going to have to drive there in order to get there. That's how it is. Um, and so businesses, you know, have this balance to you know, and communities have this balance to say. Um, we can't eliminate every single parking space or else people can't come to our restaurants. But we also want uh, people to eat outside or we need more space because we're doing well, real well. So the balance is tough. It is very challenging to make a citywide uh, approach to dining when every neighborhood is different. And it, so, again, it's one of the reasons that I think um, I think the original proposal in the legislation was to make it a 30 day window to go before the community board. I think that should be extended a little longer so that the community board actually has the time to, to look at the application, look at the business, and then give their recommendation. Because within 30 days, they might not have a meeting within those, thir those 30 days. So that's why I think extending that deadline is, is important. I think, you know, uh, I, I think this was in the original legislation saying if you're doing it in the street, certain times of the year is appropriate, but you're probably not eating outside in the dead of winter. And in the meantime, you have these sheds that just, you know, stay up, which aren't the prettiest thing. Um, I think, as I said, they should be aesthetically pleasing. The challenge citywide is I don't know what that, what like guidelines, what that looks like. It's kind of what this, I know what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like orange jersey barriers, uh, spray painted polka dot or whatever. Uh, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Um, that's what it doesn't look like. Um, so like I said, community input is extremely important to me. Um, certain times of the year, making them removable so that, you know, especially we had a business in my district where they, they spent a lot of money in this shed 
And then the DEP came and said, oh, there's like a sewer down there we have to access. Sorry, no one told you. Too bad. At a cost to you, you have to remove uh, this shed that you spent a lot of money on. And the business was like, you know what? I'm I'm not going to put it back up. It was a lot to maintain. Um, So that's why having them removable is important. Of course, that goes back to having a city agencies that talk to each other. Um, So that legislation is is still in the works. Um, As I said, I'm continuing to uh, press for certain changes to legislation to make it a little more flexible, to give community input, um, and to make it so they're not eyesores um, to to the people who live there and to other businesses. And and of course, to make sure it's fair. So that businesses who do the right thing um, are not encumbered by or, or feel like they're playing by a different set of rules than the businesses who did the wrong thing. The last part about it is uh, enforcement. Um, the issue of enforcement to me is not about trying to find, find businesses. It's about making sure that the businesses who play by the rules and do the right thing and spend the time and the money to do the right thing um, aren't at a disadvantage. And one of the issues I have right now is that I literally went to one of my business district d- d- business districts with people high up in a certain in a certain agency um, that were in charge of enforcing these rules with a tape measure and showed how some of the businesses are doing the right thing. I think it's 96 inches are supposed to be away from the curb. And some businesses were 124 inches away from the curb. And the businesses who were doing the right thing felt like kind of like, you know, uh, schmucks. I don't know. But that agency didn't enforce the rule. They didn't even talk. To, they didn't even have like that conversation with the business you want them to have, which is like, hey, I don't know if you know this. The rule is this, you're that, can you please fix it? That conversation didn't even happen. And so it's also on our agencies to make sure they're enforcing the rules so that those businesses that are doing the right thing, those businesses that are playing by the rules, often at a cost, um, aren't essentially penalized by being at a disadvantage. I think that that you you hit the nail right on the head there when it comes to communication um, within within the agencies, but also externally, I think is, is really important. Um, as you delve into 311, I know City Hall has been using Airtable to track agency communication about issues. So I don't know if, if that would be helpful for you as you, you go, go into your hearings on that. But um, uh, no, I, I think open dining is, is something that is on a lot of folks' minds. Uh, and we have a bit of a reprieve because we're getting to the winter months, but I'm sure uh, people are, ho- are hopeful of what will happen in the spring. Um, we have a couple questions that are coming in in the chat box. Um, uh, uh, one is, um, ideally, uh, how would you recommend colleges utilize existing IEPs if they're carried along uh, into higher education? So I, I, yeah, I want to be like kind of clear on what an IEP is. An IEP is specifically for you know, K through 12 students. The IEP itself is not for um, the, the university. Uh, they use like 504s. But what I would envision, so for the legislation legislates the mayor's office of people with disability to set up a program. My vision is, you know, the the person doing the IEP, their junior, senior year, talks to the family and student and says, yes, we're okay with transferring this IEP to, uh, let's say, CUNY. There's already agreements between DOE and CUNY. That's why DOE students will write their OSIS number. That is their DOE um, their DOE identification number. And so once they're accepted, they can say, oh, by the way, the student also has disability. And then I envision CUNY, um, doing outreach and saying, oh, look, hey, here's a student who in college, I mean, in high school had, was identified as having disability. Let me call them and do a phone or a, bring them into the office and saying, look, in, in high school, you were identified as having dyslexia. You had time and a half. Is that something you think you need? You want to continue? Um, and what, according to CUNY, according to their own website and their YouTube video, they're allowed to use their IEP as documentation for why they need an accommodation. So it would be for the conversation and for documentation so that um, so that the student can you know, get that support that they need so that, again, 
they do well, they succeed in their classes. They're rather they're given the opportunity to succeed. Um, and ideally, in, in in my like, I know that when students are given the opportunity to succeed, they're less likely to, to drop out, more likely um, to finish school. I mean, that's, and finish on time because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about students finishing school, finishing on time, and then like getting a job or starting a career or starting their own business. And so that's how I envision it: CUNY having information reaching out to the student, using the IP as documentation to continue their support that they've been getting for years. I think that, that that's that's great. And I, and I know while your focus uh, ha, is currently on higher education, you've got a career uh, in education. Um, and there's a question that came in that said, you know, my son has autism and he's in kindergarten. Uh, he was forced to be in a general education school instead of a specific District 75 school. And I'm very conflicted on it, and I'm fearful that he will not get the proper education and services he should be getting. How would you recommend that that parent uh, advocate for their child to get the specialized needs that they, they require? So without knowing the particular parent, uh, you know, Lisa spoke about this earlier, and what she didn't say is that it is almost a full-time job to properly advocate for your child. The truth is that the DOE does and is supposed to listen to the parent. And they take the recommendation of, of the teachers and everything, but the parent has a lot of power. There are nonprofits and organizations that actually help with this process. Sometimes they're lawyers, sometimes they're advocacy organizations, but it is, it, it is a very difficult process. Um, <clears throat> and for context of how difficult it is, I had a career, a, literal, a whole career with students with special needs in high school. And then when my students needed support services in, in pre-K, I needed help. And my this was right, my career, I needed help in understanding the, the process for younger students. Um, so I would I would find an advocacy organization or your local council member can help connect you with one. Um, that is one. I do see, by the way, a systemic problem in the way our schools are funded. Um, it's called the Fair Student Funding Formula. The DOE just came out with recommendations for its change. Um, and without getting too conspiracy theorist here, um, and this isn't the only problem, to be clear, um, but one of the problems that I saw through teaching in the system is that schools are, one of the ways schools are funded, most of their funding is through this formula that attaches funding to specific students. Students with different things on their IEPs get different amounts of money. And at the high school level, there's, I think, uh, a two, a roughly $2,000 difference between students in ICT and students in a self-contained class. And a self-contained class is a smaller class with um, students who typically need more support. And an ICT class is a class with two teachers with general education and students with disabilities mixed together. And so if a school is getting more money for students with ICT on greater than 60% of their program, a school may be financially incentivized to put more kids in an ICT class than in a self-contained class. And I recognize the question was about D75, but self-contained was also a thing. So, um, you know, and I've, and I've seen that through my career, a student may have had in high school only two of their classes in this ICT model, but the school would change that kid's IEP so that more of their classes said ICT on the IEP so that the school would get more funding from the fair student funding formula. So there is sort of this, uh, in some ways, uh, perverse financial incentive to do certain things. Now, of course, a school uh, would never say they're doing that. And the DOE would say like they're never doing that. Um, and maybe they're not, uh, but I can tell you, I know that there are schools who have done it. Um, so, so I find that to be, again, problematic in the way our schools are funded. Um, but going back to the specific question, parents have a lot of power and there are groups out there and organizations out there who help you leverage your power to get your child what they need. So I encourage you to reach out to those organizations. Uh, and if not them, then your local council member may be able to help. 
That's great. And this is, uh, we have two more questions and one of them is completely different from what we've been talking about. Um, no. uh, it's got, it's got, it's got to deal with coyotes and citywide wildlife management. <laughs> Now, council member, uh, this was not on any prepared notes for any of us, uh, so, so if you're not fully prepared on it, uh, don't worry about it. But there was a question that said, you know, you sponsored a bill on creating a city a citywide wildlife management plan. Can you speak on the significance of this? And then also just uh, internally, I did get a message on the Chamber of Commerce WhatsApp chat among the staff, and one of the employees asked about coyotes. Uh, and I, I responded back with a meme just now of, I have no idea. But if, if there's any color that you can bring to the, <laughs> these questions, we'd appreciate it. If, if it's a, we'll get back to you, I completely understand on this because I need to get back to myself on this. No, 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 no. I'm prepared for everything. Uh, I'll start with skunks. Uh, let me start with skunks, everyone's favorite animal. Mm, like a month after I was sworn in last year, I'm driving. I see my wife's car stopped in the middle of the street. I'm like, hey, honey, what's up? She goes, Eric, there's a skunk stuck in the sewer basin. And so I go over and there's a bunch of people around and figuring out how to pull the skunk out. You know, those, those sewer basins in the middle of the street that collect the water, a skunk had gotten stuck. Um, and so I was like, ah, ha, ha, arms akimbo. I'm the councilman. Let me call all the, the, the DEP. No, we don't do that. Parks, well, it's not in the park. We don't do that. Police call the parks, but I did call the park. Nothing. So what did we do? Well, like, like any, you know, typical community, some guy came with his truck. Um, we scooped out the dirt, cement, glue stuff holding the sewer metal part down. We slipped some rope through and, you know, three or four of us lifted up the, the metal sewer basin. And then a few of the people were on the other side with like olive oil trying to push the skunk back through the other way so that, you know, it didn't fall in the sewer or like get stuck there and, and die, right? And I don't know one like skunks, but I also don't like, you know, dead animals, right? That's like awful. I mean, I don't, you know, so we, you know, so my first big act as councilman, I helped save wildlife. Um, and, you know, I don't think, you know, a bunch of people getting together and like messing with city property is the best wildlife management plan. Personally, y'all may disagree. I don't think so. More recently, you specifically mentioned coyotes. That's a thing. So, you know, like a year ago, two years ago, I'm starting to hear more about coyotes. Oh, I saw a coyote. Ooh, it was at night. They run away. And then I'm starting to see, oh, I saw a coyote and it didn't run away. And I saw two coyotes and they didn't run away. A few weeks ago, um, we got a report that during the holiday of Sukkot, which is when family Jewish families eat outside in a in a sukkah and like an outdoor tent sort of thing, um, the dog, you know, was wherever and was killed by a coyote. Um, and you know, we're told, oh, like they don't mess with this, they don't mess with that. Coyote killed the dog. And then a few weeks later, I got another report that uh, I think two coyotes started chasing this dude and his dogs, and he had to run into his building. And now the doorman uh stands with a bat right to whatever that's very brave I, i'd want to tranquilize your dart but whatever um that's me during the last stated meeting a colleague of mine said in staten island deer are becoming more and more of an issue uh to let you know how bad jersey is they swim over from jersey to get to staten island that's how bad jersey is they're willing to go to staten island but the deer swim over um <laughs> And they carry Lyme disease. You know, of course, my solution is bringing the coyotes from the Bronx to Staten Island, let nature work its way out. But I'm not a wildlife management expert. Um, so throughout this, from the Bronx to Staten Island, um, whether it's something as little as a skunk being stuck in a sewer basin or coyotes scaring and damaging people's families or deer carrying Lyme disease in Staten Island, there's there's issues with wildlife. Tonight, actually, I'm having a, an educational forum with the Parks Department, I think the state D, uh, DEC, I believe, at 6.30 on Zoom um, to you know, educate my community 
uh, about the wildlife, what to do with coyotes and you know what we're doing and what can be uh, can be done. Um, so wildlife is a real issue that is impacting the lives of my constituents, the lives of Staten Islanders, uh, and having a, having a citywide wildlife management plan um, is very important in addressing these issues that we see throughout the city. That would be great. And uh, if you need any assistance on that, I know from the from the chamber side, we have uh, board members, John Cavelli from the Wildlife Society, um, who who oversees the all the zoos and, and whatnot. Um, I'm sure John would be happy to provide some feedback on things. Okay, and what I'd love to do, actually, I'd love to, I'm, I'm going to message my staff now to send you all the, um, the link if you want to share it with your, 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 uh, your people. That would be great. And, you know, we've covered a huge, uh, a very, very wide variety of topics from skunks and coyotes to higher education to students with special needs and everything in between. Um, but we always uh, close out our, our coffee and conversation with the question about, you know, out of all the things happening uh, in, in the Bronx right now, uh, in New York City right now, what are you most hopeful for? Oh boy, I know. See, so you can handle. You I can handle a lot of things. No, look, I um, you know, I, I there's there's a lot going on in the Bronx. I, I'm just hoping we can, you know, give our kids the the, the future they deserve. Um, you know, and part of that, from let's just say the government political perspective, um, is making sure that our government is working for them to provide like the opportunity uh, and the freedom that we expect in our city. Um, and to get like a little political part of that is engaging with the, with the, uh, with everyone in the community, but also listening to people and, and hearing, hearing their concerns. Um, but I, I am very hopeful that as a council, and as a Bronx delegation, we are listening and that we continue to listen to our residents to make sure that, as I said, that they have those, those opportunities to, uh, to succeed and to, and to thrive and to do well here, here in the Bronx. That they, and that they stay here in the Bronx. And I'll, I'll leave it with this. You know, there were, there were always, uh, you know, I hear two things throughout my career from teachers. And one thing made me upset and one thing gave me great hope. And you're going to tell which type of thing I said. You had a few teachers or a few people or adults who said, don't you want to do well for yourself and your family so that you can get out of the Bronx? But, I'm, but I remain hopeful because I hear more people say, a lot more people, don't you want to do well for yourself and your family so you can come back and build a better community for your family and make a better life for your family here in the Bronx? Uh, and that and that gave me great hope that we recognize that this is our home. Um, we got to fight for it. Um, but from a government perspective, I think here as Bronx elected, we we are working hard, working together to make sure that we do provide that opportunity uh, to our uh, to our Bronx residents. That's great. And that was actually probably one of the best answers that we've had to that question. And we've had a lot of folks from the council, a lot of agency heads. Uh, so that was probably the best one. And I, I don't I don't give gold stars often, but that's a great gold star right there. Well, you know what? As a, as a teacher, we live for the gold stars. <laughs> I love it. That's why um, we do the work, right? 100 percent. Lisa, do you have some closing remarks before we uh, end this session this morning? I have to say thank you. I've enjoyed this so much. Um, I will say that you're absolutely right. IEPs and the challenges for parents is a full-time job. Well worth it at the end. That's what brings out successful students, adults, and business leaders. Um, I learned about coyotes, did not know. Now something else to be afraid of. Um, but other than that, Councilman, thank you so much for your leadership. That with um, your co-chair, uh, Councilwoman Stevens, who is also near and dear to my heart. Um, I am extremely hopeful for our borough, and uh, we're not going anywhere, if anything, bigger and stronger with a lot more communication and uh, better working together. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for having me and for listening and for staying on and for, and for sharing your questions with me. I really, really appreciate this opportunity very much. 
Great, thank you so much. This has been Coffee and Conversation with Council Member Eric Dinowitz, the chair of the New York City Council Committee on Higher Education. Uh, Council Member, we are super grateful that you were with us today. Thank you so much for uh, sharing all the information uh, from skunks to higher education and everything in between. Really appreciate that. Uh, and for the folks that are on joining us on social media, but also in the Zoom chat, this will be available uh, on the Chamber YouTube channel and also circulated out with our thank you email uh, at, at the end of the session. Uh, we have the next cohort of speakers coming up. We have uh, U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer uh, and Secretary of Transportation uh, Pete Buttigieg talking about infrastructure uh, coming into the Bronx and some funding that's coming down the pike. And also Council Member Althea Stevens talking about youth services and and learning and, and how we can activate more of our young people uh, in the workforce. Um, so stay tuned and be sure to follow the Chamber of Commerce using the uh, at the new BXCC. Again, thank you so much, Council Member. Uh, we really appreciate you and your leadership for the Bronx, uh, and we look forward to our continued partnership. Thanks so much. Thank you.